Okay, good evening, everyone. We are ready to begin the Benicia Unified School District board meeting for November 7th. There is nothing to report out in closed session this evening. Um, so we are going to move along and begin with the pledge. So if everybody would please stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. All right, I'm going to start with a request for an approval of the agenda. I make a motion that we approve the agenda as presented. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. Hearing none, the agenda passes as written. We're going to start with our highlight for Joe Henderson. Dr. Beetson, are you going to head that up for us, please? Sure will. Um, I am really thrilled to invite Miss Melanie Buck to the podium. Uh, she is our principal of Joe Henderson Elementary School, and she's here tonight to shine a light on some exciting things happening at her school. Okay, good evening, board members and district officials and people in the audience. I am Melanie Buck. I'm proud principal of Joe Henderson Elementary. So um, I, we, I was invited to share some exciting things that are happening up on our site, tucked away in the hills. And so um, I thought I'd share what's cooking at Joe Henderson. It's my first time on this. Let's see. Thank you. <laughs> I thought about doing this in, in uh, you know, some sort of accent, but um, it's late, so I won't bore you with that. So multi-tiered systems of support, it's what's for dinner, it's what we do. So I thought I'd run through our three big buckets of multi-tiered systems of support. So first of all, we have the recipe for positive behavior. It serves all. So the ingredients are PBIS, Tier 1, and Tier 2. Our Tier 1 team has shifted a little bit, and it's gotten a little bit smaller because we've uh, sloughed off a few of the PBIS Tier 1 members to um, move to Tier 2. And Tier 2 is really putting systems in for groups of kids, like one system. So the one system we're going to implement that we're currently um, we're about to start. I'm so excited because it's been a lot of work. It's called a uh, Seco check-in, check-out. We use this hug form. It's hello, update, goodbye. And so it's really just to build relationships with kids and um, set a goal for the day, see if they meet that goal, track that data, and hopefully uh, replace some negative behaviors with positive behaviors. Uh, another ingredient are our chit chats and our SST system. So um, historically in Benicia, we held chit chats to talk about kids in the academic setting with a group of adults um, talking about these kids, and then in the um, social emotional behavioral setting with a group of adults talking about kids. And what I realized is they were the same kid, and you're talking about them in two different settings. How about get everybody together at one table and talk about it at once? So we ran through two full days of kids with every single stakeholder, every support person that we can think of, and we brought 101 names to the table of how can we support this kid. And some of them were, you know, they just come to, uh, come to school sad. Nothing going on at home. They're not missing out academically or anything. Um, so that was exciting to uh, shift that model. And then um, SST system, we're really trying to hone in on having it be an action plan and with follow-ups and um, um, goals and did they meet those goals? Um, Swiss is the data system that we use for PBIS, and we are currently um, shifting the data that we use. So instead of just pulling data periodically or monthly for tier one, we're pulling it every week and saying, okay, who has the most referrals? What are we doing for them? Shift in, shift out, move them through. So, um, and we've been asked to share that with the other elementary schools too, because we're the first school to be using Swiss that way. Um, and then Recess Club, uh, we have alternate alternative things to do for recess um, on our site. And um, our parents trained Mary Farmer parents, so now they're getting a recess club. So I'll share some pictures with that um, uh, with you about that. So the preparation is creative environment wherein all students feel welcome and then provide specific supports in an action plan to tier two and tier three students, offer parent and staff supports as well. Um, 
and we offered a couple of classes. We had some flyers and invited parents to some classes, and then stir with some understanding and love. So the recipe highlight is the recess club. It serves 20 to 30. Um, that black picture on the left, it's actually a pouch. I wear one every single day. If you've been to my site, you've seen me wearing it. I have my stickers in there and my keys and my phones. And then for each recess club activity, there's more than coloring, but for each activity, there's a be safe, be respectful, be responsible. So there's rules for it. Totally parent led, entirely parent led. So it, that's really cool. Um, so there's some of our recess clubs. Uh, we have Legos. Um, we do do yoga out on the grass. Uh, they did these twirly things. There's building things. I w walk out there and kids are doing all kinds of stuff. So it's an alternative for kids who may not want to play basketball, tetherball, kickback, maybe not into sports. So the second bucket we have for MTSS is the recipe for academics. It serves all as well. The ingredients are um, our reading coaches. Uh, they're our tutors that um, you all approve. Thank you very much for approving that in the LCAT. Um, feedback is awesome that we're actually, you know, kids are getting uh, supports at least twice a day um, to really beef up that reading. So that's really exciting. Um, we have targeted students in all classes. Every single teacher gave a, a group of kiddos that they will be targeting, having targeted instruction to increase their academics. Focus on conferring. Um, and that is... Um, specifically in ELA and math. So they can have one-on-one -on -one conversations in reading, one-on-one -on -one conversations in writing, one-on-one -on -one conversations in math, and it also hits um, to the other, um, uh, our other goal in a district, in our district, which is um, being inclusive, including um, uh, making sure all students are uh, feeling welcome and included. And then we have an attendance, attendance incentive, and then we shared best practices at uh, site PDs. So the preparation is provide high expectations for all students, implement specific supports for targeted students, and serve with a side of focused evaluation goals, which is awesome. Our evaluation goals are, are really, really um, spot on this year of, of what they want, what staff wants to grow on. So that's cool. So here's some pictures. Um, Let's see, the top left and bottom center are both um, uh, plans for teachers. Okay, I'm gonna meet with these kids today, and then these are the notes that, that I took today during my um, small group or my conferring. The bottom left, our fifth grade uh, tried a new unit of study this year in, um, in the beginning, and um, westward expansion was uh, what they had worked on, but they really had some great writing about that. Um, the top center is a phone message. So those are actually, this is really cool. Those are stickies. And so when teachers meet with a student and they say, okay, what do you want to work on? I want to work on use of power words in my writing. Okay, great. They write it on there, they stick it and off they go. And then the teachers have a record of what they talk to the students about. Um, top right, a whole bunch of our teachers are doing student-led conferences. So the students reflect on what they did. They have goals um, and they actually grade themselves. And then they lead the conference with the parents. This is what I did. This is what I want to do. This is where I am. And it's it. the teacher almost says nothing. So that's uh, really exciting. So fifth grade and second grade are 100% in and then spots here and there. Um, and then bottom right was just a cool piece of writing that I took a picture of. Um, and top left is the tutor. He's uh, Coach Parker uh, with our kiddos. Um, the bottom left is students using Alexia. And if you can see on the right, there's a little temperature gauge, a thermometer. They're gauging, um, how, the, getting through the lessons and how well they did. Top right is a guided reading lesson. Um, excuse me, it is a um, reader's workshop lesson, reader's workshop small group. And then bottom right are our kindergartners. Looking so cute. And finally is the recipe for social emotional wellness. It serves all the ingredients. We have two mindful, mindfulness coaches that come up and they push into classrooms on Tuesdays and then they're starting, they start to tailor back so that way the teachers can start doing the mindfulness and teaching mindfulness. Um, staff self-care, we uh, provided um, some self-care instructions to staff. Um, to make sure we're all taking care of ourselves. And in that, we learned self-indulgence is not self-care. We had to repeat that. And then I put, and then I was saying it, I was, I was eating a big burrito, so it didn't really matter. Um, 
We are in the final phases of getting a grant for um, several schools in our district, and we're one of the schools, so I have huge, grandiose ideas for our wellness room, um, so that is to come, but I'll share pictures with you um, later on about that. Um, we bought mindfulness chimes for every classroom. Uh, each teacher committed to giving 10 minutes for student voice, whether it's a community circle or a class meeting. Um, or you know, shout outs, whatever. And then two of our teachers went to an SCL conference with Ronnie Habib, and they're going to be bringing back information. I did a phone conference with him. So the preparation is provide tools and strategies for JHE community, teach self-management, self and social awareness, relationship building, and hopefully to relax. And here's some pictures. Top left, that was a parent workshop we did on mindfulness. Bottom left, we used some uh, monies to purchase I use some money to purchase a neck massager for teachers, and they use it in the staff room all the time. Um, the top right, that is one of our kindergartners, and, and because of all the stuff we put in place, he doesn't do that anymore in my office. So that's fabulous. I haven't made him come in and wash the walls yet, but um, he's, he's cutie. I, he, he and his twin are very, very sweet. And then we bought the mindfulness chimes. Oh, top right, um, long stretch of October. Everybody's losing it. So I did a um, jeans tober for the staff. And so each day there was a calendar and each day they had they could wear jeans with something. So one, one day was wear boots with your jeans and kick negativity to the curb. And another day, that day happened to be um, something about your spotted being awesome wear your leopard print or something. So that's what Uwe and Karen are doing. Uh, poker chips, I bought those at a garage sale for students for self-regulation and they can, you know, add poker chips and take po poker chips away with their feelings and it's this other thing. And then the bottom middle or the bottom right is uh, it, we paired students up for a um, uh, kind of a co coaching luncheon with the upper graders and lower graders and it was just a mixed bag for lunch. So all in all, I think that we are doing a pretty good job up at Joe Henderson with uh, stirring the pot and making sure that everybody is, is getting their needs met. So thank you for letting me share today. So thank you very much for all you do up there. I hear some really good things going on at Henderson. So it's exciting to have our schools come forward here so they could share. Okay, we're going to move on to some reports. So even though we don't have students here, I want you to close your eyes and pretend we do because we have their report. Mm -hmm. um, so Ireland from Liberty High School came, brought her report over and she wasn't able to stay tonight because of some work she has to get done. So we offered to share on her behalf. Liberty High School participated in Red Ribbon, Red Ribbon Week. Thanks to Benicia Youth Action Coalition and their generous donation, we planted over 100 red tulips and received wristbands and water bottles to help spread the message of being clean and sober, having a clean and sober life. For Halloween, we decorated the school and learned about Day of the Dead. Several students helped clean up our city cemeteries. These students hope to be able to volunteer there at least once a month. In our Learning Through Interest program, students visited Factory OS located on Mare Island. Their warehouse was used to manufacture submarines during World War II. Now this is space for manufacturing small houses that help address affordable housing and homelessness issues in the Bay Area. We also visited CT Hot Rods, Toland Metals, High End Uniform, and Hinton Beauty and Barber College. We have several students ready to take the next steps that will lead them to internship placements. Tomorrow, they will be having an annual blood drive. Liberty uh, encouraging all of those who qualify to please donate. You can drop in at our school site from 10 to 1. And Ireland wanted to make sure that we emphasize that. It's open to everybody from 10 to 1 at the school site. Okay, thank you. So we thank Ireland for a great report, and thank you for reading it. Okay, we're going to move on to some board reports real quickly. Um, Mrs. Zeta, do you have anything you'd like to share? We attended. We? And I attended um, along with um, Leslie Beetson. God, my head is not thinking right now. <laughs> and um, there was a Valero Benefit for Children's Award presentation at um, the clock tower. tower. And we were the beneficiaries, or Benicia Education Foundation were the beneficiaries of $30,000. 
uh, donated for the wheel program at all of our elementary schools, which we were very pleased to be there to participate in that. And that's really all I've been up to this week, okay. last two weeks. Thank you. Dr. Young and I uh, worked with Principal Dalski at the middle school, and we took a tour of all the construction. It's coming along really well. We're going to have some beautiful outdoor spaces for the students, as well as a lot of updates to the indoor spaces. Um, we also spoke with the sixth grade cohort teachers and learned more about how they're utilizing um, their new technologies. And it was great to be able to um, have um, the yearbook teacher, and she's a yearbook and history teacher, Erin. Her last name is escaping me right now. O'Leary, thank you. <laughs> she um, had her students show us how to use all the different features on the new history software. And so we went um, from classroom to classroom, and they did a full demonstration for us, which was really great. And um, so that was a good turnout. And since we have the Joe Henderson team here tonight, I also wanted to um, highlight their upcoming event, which is Parents' Night Out in February. And it's a fundraiser for their schools, Parent Teacher Association. And so keep that on your list if you're looking for a really great activity. OK, well, we also hit this week um, bond measure meeting. So that will be coming forward soon. We got um, we were looking at upcoming projects, and we were also looking at the results of the middle school site construction. So that will be coming forward to a public board meeting really soon. And it was kind of exciting to see um, the energy in the room, because we did have the Mary Farmer principal with us at this last meeting. And they're the next school that we're talking about. So needless to, to say, Melissa, I would think it'd be fair to say she was pretty excited at this meeting. Um, so we're looking at um, at some at some improvements at that school as well. Also, we were getting some word that some of those um, bonds that are some of those reimbursements that we would pour from the state are starting to trickle in. We've gotten our first one, so that's great. So we've got several more sitting up there, so hopefully that will get a positive response on all of them. So that was a very positive meeting. I love when money is coming back to the district. Um, the other meeting that I was I had the privilege of being part of was our city and our school district meeting. And yeah, you forgot about all those. So Dr. Hogan was with me, and actually so was Mr. Young and Mr. Lars Faga that are sitting out there. It was actually, it was a great opportunity, and it was a fabulous meeting we worked with. Um, we worked with our city, and we really were talking about, I think the thrust of our meeting was about supporting each other in communication and different activities that were going on. So I think with that said, I'd like to make sure that we acknowledge and we thank the city and Lori Tinsbro, our um, city manager, they she put out an amazing communication in the her letter. She does a weekly letter from the city of Benicia to let us know what's going on. And she put forward the information about us moving from at large to area because we asked if there was some way she can help us reach more people in the community. And so I want to thank the city for doing that, because I thought that was just great. It really helped a lot. Um, and also, I found out, too, just as when we were at the Valero benefit the other night, that I was speaking to a couple of people that are employees up at Valero. And Valero also put it out to all of their employee group. They have, they are the largest employer in our, in our community. And they apparently, they, too, do a newsletter. So we're getting some great cooperation and some great support with, with getting the message out to folks. So I want to just make sure we acknowledge and thank the city and that we also acknowledge and thank Valero for helping us. Do we have a message from the superintendent in any way? OK. All right, well, then I'm going to move on to public comment. Members of the public may address the board at any regular meeting on any item within the board's jurisdiction. Cards may be completed requesting to address the board. They are available at the back table and may be submitted to the board secretary at the meeting. The governing board allows speakers to speak at regular meetings that agendize and not agendize matters under public comment. Comments are limited to no more than three minutes per speaker. By law, no action may be taken on any item raised during the public comment periods, and matters may be referred to staff for placement on future agendas of the governing board. 
With that said, we do have two speakers who have turned in their blue slips, and that would be Jojo Donetti and Gretchen. So Jojo, you want to come first, approach the podium? Thank you. Uh, Jojo Donetti, Benicia High Tennis Coach and Benicia Community Tennis Association. Just here to thank you for fixing the tennis courts at the middle school and the high school. They are awesome. Um, they are great to play on. It's good seeing the kids out there in the after school program at the middle school. They're playing hard. They're running hard like they've never been able to. At the high school, uh, we were able to have some very competitive play against our uh, competition this year. And we didn't have to warn them about the cracks and the holes. <laughs> so it was it was kind of nice not being the worst tennis courts in the district in the in the league anymore. Uh, so I wanted to thank Trustee Zeta for her genuine concern for the safety of the kids and uh, maintenance director Alfredo Romero for his persistence and getting a good contractor to do the work. So with that, uh, we're just waiting on the good windscreens. We'll be all good to go. So thank you. Okay, Gretchen. Hello, I'm Gretchen Burgess. I'm wearing a couple different hats, and I'm hoping the first one you will actually take action on because my Kiwanis Club is hosting a bingo event this Sunday at the Chill starting at 4 o'clock. The proceeds are going to go and support the music program in the schools, particularly the band, since it's going off to New York this year. So I'm hoping that you will all take action, show up at 4 o'clock, buy lots of bingo cards and support these kids and their wonderful, wonderful music program. And in that vein, I'd like to thank you for doing the work that you did to the public art or the performing arts building, the PAB. I, it's hard to remember what it's called. That, um, <laughs> we walked in there as band parents this year and just went, oh, how lovely. There's still some work that could be done, but oh, it's so nice to see effort being put into that program because the kids in that program are just so magnificent. The next thing that I wanted to talk about is pursuing better practices with smoke. For the fourth year in a row, we've had incredible fires, and this seems to be the new normal. And the last bout of fires that we had, the kids were told to go to school, and then a couple hours they were told to go home again. Um, and there was quite a bit of strife I heard from other parents about come and go, come and go. So we're really looking forward to the school district developing better procedures because unfortunately this does seem to be our new normal. And last but not least, I see a couple of our city leadership here and they know I like to sit at the, I'm gonna get this wrong, um, traffic pedestrian bicycle safety, yes. And you know something that, <laughs> I'm going to say it offends me, is that I don't see anybody from the school district there. And the, one of the things we talk about the most there is the safety of our children coming and going to school. Personally, they know I have been rabid about the intersection at Military and 7th Street on the west side, which mm -hmm. is an insane intersection. Kids are constantly, and since I walked to Mary Farmer, and now my child walks to the high school now, trying to cross that intersection with people turning into you is terrifying. But there are a lot of other places where it's really, really scary. And Mary Farmer had a parent that was mowed down by somebody. Yeah, you remember that. All of this takes place on city streets and really, really impacts the children coming and going to school. And yet, at this meeting, we don't have representation from the school district there. So I would really love it, particularly since right now I am working on a Barnes Crossing at the high school, and none of you guys know what that is. But if you came to the meetings, you would, and I am out of time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Attractive. Okay, was this not the transportation one that was just canceled on us? Uh, it's traffic and 
and someone that's checking you. Yes, and they call me a quarterly. So it's easy to learn. So this is different than our safe routes to schools meetings. Okay, because safe route is what was canceled on us just recently. Okay, so this is an additional committee. Okay, good to know. Thank you very much. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, I'm going to, as where, are, if there are no other speakers coming forward, I am going to move on. Okay, consent calendar. Um, all matters listed under the consent calendar are considered by the board to be routine and will be approved by the board in one motion. There will be no discussion on these items unless members of the board, staff, or public request specific items to be pulled and discussed. Um, I need, and are there any comments from the board on any of these? Then I am going to call for a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented. I make a motion to um, approve the, the consent calendar as presented. I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the consent calendar passes. Okay, with that said, though, I do want to make a comment. We have several field trips, as I'm sure some of you have seen on the consent calendar. And the district over the last couple of years has been working really hard to get procedures and protocols in place so that, in fact, we know ahead of time before trips are going and groups are organizing that, in fact, they have already been approved. Um, before any fundraising begins, the procedure is that the trips need to come forward to the school board for approval. They are, it's not an after fact, but in fact, it's supposed to be before. So. Um, I am absolutely willing to go and speak with the high school group and, and help to share that information. We are getting a field trip right now that we are going to approve, and we are, we just approved it. Um, money, a lot of money has been put out, and we don't want to have that come back on parents. So, but it is going to be really important. The middle school does a great job of following through and working with their protocols. They, too, have groups that have to do fundraising in groups, and we, the elementary schools do as well. So it looks like one of the areas that we need to provide some additional support is to our high school. So I just do want to put that out there, and I want it to be out in our public meeting as well. Okay, with that said, the governing board is going to convene a public hearing now where we will receive public testimony concerning the proposed trustee voting area plans associated with the district's transition to a bi-trustee election system. So I am going to close our board meeting, and I'm opening up a public hearing. We'll now convene a public hearing to receive public testimony concerning proposed trustee voting area plans associated with the district's transition to a bi-trustee election system. Under California sections code 10010, the board must hold at least two public hearings prior to holding a public hearing to adopt a final trustee voting plan. Gentlemen. Good evening, board, cabinet, staff, community members. I'm Jonathan Salt with F3. I'm joined by Andrew Chittapong from Cooperative Strategies. They are the demographic firm helping the district with this transition. Um, we're at a new stage of the process. We had two pre-map public hearings. Now the demographers created three map options for public consideration, and there'll be three public hearings. This is the first of three, another one later this month, and then one in uh, early to mid-December. No, I should turn it on. Um, again, a little background just in case there's anybody new here today. Um, this process is taking place because of the California Voting Rights Act, or CVRA, which prohibits at-large elections if those elections impair the ability of members of protected classes from influencing the outcome of those elections. It's a very low bar to prove a violation of the CVRA, um, and so the district is um, proactively transitioning to make sure that it's safe from potential litigation. Um, it is the only safe harbor election system from a CVRA claim, and the district's divided into five roughly equal population areas, and a board member will be elected um, from each trustee area by the residents of that area. 
doesn't affect anybody's current term. Everyone still serves out their full term regardless of where they live or the maps that are drawn. Um, so like I mentioned, now we're in a new stage, the draft map stage, and I'll hand it off to Andrew to talk about that. So some criteria that we have to follow when we're drawing these maps is that we are using the 2010 census data, and we are um, able to use some additional data that's updated, that's permitted. Um, each area shall use a population that's practicable. Uh, so we're using total people instead of uh, citizens because we're using everybody that's counted. Um, each trustee area shall be nearly equal in population, and we are able to use a 10% deviation. And the reason that it isn't going to necessarily be a perfect even number per trustee area is because census blocks are the smallest amount of data that can be used to accurately count everybody. And they're not always the same size. They're not always the same shape. They're not always equally populated. So there's a little bit of a, a gap between some of the trustee areas, but they're, they're within an acceptable range. So with the 10% uh, deviation, I'll get into some more information uh, later in the slide in the presentation. Uh, so some other considerations and criteria, uh, according to the California Constitution, it must comply with the U.S. Constitution, be uh, population uh, equal in each area, comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act, be geographically contiguous, um, keep local communities of interest together, be geographically compact and cannot favor or discriminate against an incumbent or political candidate. So here are, uh, is the uh, demographics for Benicia Unified. So on the left, we have just a general demographic or geographic profile that includes the cities that encompass the school district as well as the demographic breakdown uh, for the total population and the 18 years and older population on the right side of the slide. So the total population is about 27,000 people. And if we divide that by five for each of the five board members, each area is going to contain about 5,400 people. With a 10% variant, it's going to contain plus or minus 540 people. So we have the uh, population breakdown for the protected classes. So Hispanic Latino is about 12%, the white population at 66%, African American at 58.28%. Um, and the next largest demographic group is the Asian population at almost 11%. And the total population for those who are 18 years and older, that number comes out to be uh, close to 21,000, and we're going to focus more on the citizens voting age population, also known as CVAP, or your eligible voters within the school district. So uh, the total number comes out to be almost 21,000 for the school district. And one reason why that number is a little bit larger is the, the citizen voting age population data is based off of an estimate that's a rolling average over a five-year period that's more recent than the census. So clearly more people have moved into the district since that time, or at least more voting age citizens. And what we're really going to be focusing more are the percentages that you see here on the screen. So the Hispanic Latino is about 12%. The white population is about... 68%, uh, the African American at 5.16%, and the next largest is the Asian population at 10%. So when we get to the maps, we're going to show some numbers and how those numbers are affected by each trustee area and how they're divided. So when we talk about uh, voting power or increased influence, we're talking about the numbers that are higher than the district-wide average that you see right now on the screen. And obviously looking at these numbers, you know, 12% Latino CVAP or 10% Asian CVAP, it's not a gigantic number. So you're not going to see a trustee area map where one of those ends up being 40 or 50%, but an increase would satisfy the law. And we make an in increase by looking at the concentration of where a particular demographic group lives. So on the left side, we have the Hispanic Latino citizens voting age population and the lighter colors represent uh, less dense areas, and the darker colors represent more dense for the Hispanic Latino citizens voting age population. And you can see that there's really no dark or concentrated areas, um, but we'll see how each map um, affects this demographic group. And as well, we have the uh, citizens voting age population for the Asian population, also kind of scattered, no real concentration. Um, but it's the same table, different demographic group for the, the map. And I should note that the very top there, that light blue area, that is a, very, a particularly large census block, but that often means when they're that large that there's actually less people in them and it's generally open space. 
So even though there's a large blue splotch on the screen, it doesn't mean that there's a significant Asian population there. It's just the percentage there is about 20% of the people who live in that block. We did not count the cows, um, <laughs> but um, I'm sure that we can uh, calculate how many live in that area at some point. It's really relatively small, like maybe under 10, yeah, 10 people maybe. So that brings us to um, our maps, our first draft maps here. We do have three tonight. We can talk about the layout and what the symbology means. So um, like we said earlier, we are using census blocks, which are the smallest geographic feature. Um, so sometimes these census blocks are not the most cleanest shape. So we might get some more jagged edges for the divisions or uh, because of the population equality, we might have to use a census block in instead of following a major road. Um, so each color is associated with a trustee area. So trustee area one is yellow, trustee area two is green. It's kind of hard to yeah. see. Folks can't see the, the gap here between the yellow and the green is similar. Yeah. So uh, trustee area two is green, area three is red, area four is blue, and trustee area five is purple. So each uh, trustee area is going to be the same color throughout each map. And then we also have a legend that shows where all the school facilities are within the district. So you have your elementary, your middle school and your high school, as well as the board members and where they live on the map. And you'll notice that each trustee area color is associated with the year. And that year represents when that area becomes available uh, during the next election for that year. And that's based off the term year for the incumbent. And then we also have the uh, population breakdown uh, in each trustee area. So that includes the total population, the variance, uh, population 18 years and older, as well as the citizens voting age population. So I'm going to attempt to explain how each area is divided uh, for each scenario. So <laughs> area one in yellow, we're using 2nd Street, and it's following the 680 all the way to the top, and as well as it's going um, south to Liberty High School as our first area. Um, area two, it's following the 780, and uh, touching the Suisan Bay um, community down at the very bottom. Sassoon, thank you. <laughs> and area three in red, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that it's part of the Highland Park community. And um, area four, I believe that is also um, Southampton Park, as well as following the 780. And then area five is including uh, Frank Skillman Park in that community for the first uh, map one scenario. So what does that do to the numbers? So we have um, highlighted numbers that means that increased influence uh, higher than the district average. And just to refresh everybody's memory, the Hispanic Latino is 12%, the African American is about 5.16%, and the Asian population is about uh, 10%. So as we saw how spread out all those populations were on the other maps, um, so just, you know, there's not a giant leap. You get from, you know, 12% to 13 for the uh, Hispanic community or for the Asian community, 10 to in one of these up to 19, which is a pretty significant jump. Um, still not a giant amount total, but it does increase the influence of that group to uh, impact the election. So we do have uh, two areas of increased influence for the Hispanic Latino community, uh, areas four and five two areas for African Americans um, in areas two and four. I believe area two in scenario one is the largest uh, increased influence out of the three maps being 7.72%, which is about uh, two and a half percentage points higher. And that is the highest of the three. And then we have two areas for the Asian population in areas three and five, and area five with the 18.95%, that is the highest of the three maps as well for this particular uh, demographic group. So scenario two, very similar to scenario one. Uh, this time, the difference being that uh, the yellow area, trustee area one, is now following the 680 instead of uh, going around to the second street, going more towards uh, Liberty High School and taking more of the military 
uh, community as opposed to the Second Street community. And then uh, very similar to the previous uh, map one, area two is also taking uh, the whole southern portion of uh, 780 and part of the military community, but also crossing the freeway um, to get more of that population. So anytime a line is moved on one of these maps, you have to make up for it somewhere else. So if you you know, slide the yellow line or the purple line one way, you're adding population to that area. So you have to take it away somewhere else or find it somewhere else for the one that you're taking. So that's why it almost looks like um, a little bit of like kind of a morphing where the yellow slides, the purple fills in, everyone shifts over a little bit. And trustee area three in red, it's also taking that um, Highlands Park community and dipping down further south as opposed to the previous scenario. Area four is now taking um, Frank Skillman Park. Skillman, thank you. <laughs> as the community, as opposed to area five, area five is now taking Southampton as part of the community um, for the second map. So this time we get uh, one area of increased influence instead of, a, instead of two areas for the Hispanic Latino community, and that number is 15. 0.2%, uh, and that is the highest of the three scenarios for this particular demographic group of the three. And then instead of two areas for the African American community, we get three areas of in increased influence uh, in areas two, four, and five. And we also get an additional increased area for the Asian population, uh, three, four, and five, areas three, four, and five, as opposed to two in the previous scenario. That brings us to our last map of the night, and this is map three. Uh, probably a little bit the most drastic out of the two maps. Uh, area one is taking mo most of the northern portion of the district, as well as um, uh, coming all the way down, following Second Street into military in that community. What's interesting about this one is that military, that the whole community south of, south of the 780, it's it's divided in three trustee areas as opposed to two that we saw in uh, maps one and two. So I guess it would be from the eastern side of military to the central side of uh, military with area two and then the western side for area three of military as well as area three uh, taking in that middle school as part of the, that community. And so what that would mean if this was the map, for example, that there would be a trustee who at least represents some residents in three different trustee areas in that community. Sure. So just looking at this map, as again, as an example, everybody who lives south of the 780, um, you know, regardless of where the trustee currently is or could be elected from, um, essentially, if we consider this to be one large community, well, there are three different trustee areas that cover that community. So even if the trustee lives elsewhere, they're still responsible for folks in that neighborhood, three different trustees would be responsible. So there's actually a lot of reach by doing that. And that leads us to uh, area four in blue, taking uh, Highland Park, and as well as going um, to Lake Herman as the uh, fourth area, and the fifth area taking Skillman. Yes. Skillman as the community, as well as going further south to the 780 as the fifth area. So what does that do to our numbers? A um, little bit different. So we have one area of increased influence for the Hispanic Latino community, two areas for the African American community, and two areas for the Asian population uh, for the third map and third scenario tonight. So I'm gonna pass it over to John. I believe that there's a typo on this page, correct? Yeah, so this is the schedule. Uh, right now, we're right in the middle of the process, November 7th. The next meeting is November 21st, which is properly on the website. This is my error on the PowerPoint. And then the final public hearing, just like tonight, will be December 12th. After that public hearing, the board will then vote on which map it will choose and then petition the county to approve of its transition. So I guess uh, what maps does anybody like best or what comments do folks have about the maps? Okay, so at this point in the public hearing, members of the public may submit comments on the establishment of the voting area. So I would ask that um, maybe if you use the sheet so we know if you want to come forward and talk, that would be helpful. Um, and then speakers will be given three minutes to make comments on this matter. 
and this matter only. Okay, Gretchen, come on up. Can, can we just point out too that um, this is posted on our website? And yes. This is the first of three public hearings, so it's a lot of information just so people, if they don't have questions tonight, they can take a look at them in more detail and come back <clears throat> two more times before um, a final decision is made. Yes, and I also believe on the website there's an opportunity to also input, comment. make comments or input feedback as well. So know that that is another opportunity, another another media that you can also use. You don't have to be sitting here and coming up. So if you go home and think of a question, go on the website too. There's one more comment. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. There's also on the website, there is a, a Google Maps that you can actually click on, zoom in, find your house, find the neighborhoods. That makes it a little bit more clear than these larger maps. Um, and so that's an interesting feature that folks can take a look at as well. They're talking about me. I just know it. As well, they should. One of the comments that we're being asked to remind everybody of is we know that we have to be dividing our district up into five areas because there are five members that sit on our school board. But we're not sitting for us just because there are five board members that make up our school board. We are not. We have deliberately asked that we not be divided and tied to a school because this is our school board. This is our school district. We are all responsible and committed to supporting our school district. So if I land in one spot. I am not only representing Joe Henderson, I represent every school in the district. So we wanted to make sure everybody is aware of that. That was a commitment that we thought was of the most important um, priority to us as a board. So as we move forward, we are the board for Benicia Unified School District, not just one school. Okay, cool. This only changes how board members are elected. It doesn't change how And I want to thank you because I got online and did the little survey and then had the comments afterwards. And one of the things I commented on was that um, in the many years that I've been coming to these meetings, quite often the person that I aligned with um, the closest was a representative who lived furthest away from me. So you're not necessarily going to have somebody in your district who you are kismic with. One of my big questions is, what after these lines are drawn, what if somebody in that district doesn't want to run? What do we do then? Um, and then, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about people's genetic makeup and the color of their skins. But in Benicia, we have things that people feel even more strongly about. So I'm, you know, well, I'm just not really tied to skin since my family falls both in that very Anglo and that pesky little Asian population out there. Um, but we ha we're a community of artists who feel very differently than our community who works at the refinery who feel very differently from our retired folks, who feel very differently than our local business people. And these populations have a tendency to live in certain areas. So how are we keeping these populations and these people who might feel very strongly? I've lived in, well, I've lived on the west side for over 40 years. And I identify very strongly with the West Side. And I have friends who live in what we call Water's End, who feel very strongly about their community and have very different views about where they live and the education of their children. Uh, I was a part of the Moms Club here in town. I was the only old town person in that group. And although we got along wonderfully, the way we viewed our children's education was very different. I was so glad I had Mary Farmer to go to. Um, so I think these types of representations really need to be thought of. And those pesky little um, deviations like 780, 
they have a much stronger impact on the people who live here. That freeway is huge. And me trying to figure out whether or not I have one, two, or three representatives within a two block radius of me would be very confusing. I want a West Sider, man. I want a West Sider. So thank you very much for your time. And, um, thank you for your comments. I'm happy to answer some of that. Um, it, what happens if nobody runs from an area? Uh, the same as if nobody ran for the board now. It, there's a board bylaw, I think it's 9223, that's filling vacancies. Um, and there's a process where the board can appoint or potentially an election can be held. But unlike now, where as long as the person lives in the district, they can be appointed, it must be someone from that area. So I imagine that if there was uh, generally low interest in a trustee area where there doesn't seem like there was going to be someone that was going to run, I imagine the district would try to um, put information out about what it means to be a board member. It's not an uncommon issue at first uh, to try to solicit good candidates. The other part that you mentioned about communities of interest and that it's not necessarily based off of someone's, um, you know, ethnic identity, um, that's actually very important information that can be considered in this process. And so um, we encourage you to submit comments. If you were to say this part of town, um, these folks generally identify with each other, that is a community group. Let us know so we can make sure we try to reflect that in the maps. Communities of interest is an aspect that can be considered. Are there any or comments or questions from anyone in the audience? No other speakers? Then at this time, I'm going to say thank you for your comments and thank you for the press. Next, next meeting. Please share with your colleagues that there are two more meetings in which, and also an online option to collect comments because we want to hear from as many people as possible. Um, so share widely. Tell them how fun and exciting this was. Come again. <laughs> They're getting to draw a color, whatever. But come on. <laughs> Um, all right, so with that said, I'm going to say thank you for the presentation. We will thank see you. you at our next board meeting. Um, so just remind everybody to come. And I am going to close the public board meeting, and I am going to reopen the board meeting. And I am going to move on to 13.1, which is consideration and approval of the early, early notification re retirement incentive. And I'm going to turn that over to Dr. Gill. Thank you, Governing Board, and um, uh, good evening, members of the audience. So uh, this is our annual request we bring to the board to approve um, uh, this action item uh, because uh, this is a way for us to figure out um, our staffing. Um, and when we are able to figure out our, our staffing early enough, we are able to start hiring soon, um, which helps us uh, um, hire highly qualified staff in all of our positions. And we are very proud to say that for the past two years, we have been fully staffed, especially in teaching and administration positions when we open the school. So that will be our goal that we want to continue to fulfill um, with this. And then, the, so we will be sending this information once the board approves it uh, to all staff, all district, basically what this means is that any staff members who intend to retire at the end of, on their last work day uh, of 2019-20 school year, if they inform us in writing by putting a form, uh, official form in uh, by uh, Friday, January 10th, 2020 at 4.30 p.m., uh, we take that deadline very seriously. Um, they will be receiving up to 1500 if they're a full-time employee, 1500 or prorated, depending on their FTE, uh, an incentive as a retirement uh, notification. And uh, we also want to make sure that we inform everybody the letter of intent will be non-revocable. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Gill? All right, hearing none, I am going to call for a motion to approve the early notification of retirement incentive bonus. I'll make a motion to approve the uh, retirement incentive bonus. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. Dr. Gill, you're up again. 13.2 is consideration and approval of a new job description for the special education assistant two. Um, thank you, um, uh, President Frucci. So this is actually, in, uh, even though we're bringing as a revised 
new job description, but the, the employees have been working in the district for years. Um, uh, so this, uh, this, uh, so these employees used to work as SPAs before. So in uh, 2000, summer 2018, uh, during the classification process, they were classified as SP, SEA2s because of the duties they performed, which was more than SPAs. They were very similar to uh, SEA, emotionally disturbed uh, job description, but still different enough to create a new job description. <coughs> and uh, so this is something um, we just, it was pending to do that we just needed to do it uh, and uh, memorialize this job description to specifically uh, relate to the employees' work they have been performing and uh, um, and so on. Even though the, it does say the pay range salary from 31 to 34, again, this is not new to us. This has been existent. Um, these employees have been getting paid this uh, since then. It was approved by the board as a change at that time, but we would just need to bring the job description forward. Okay. Any questions or comments for Dr. Gill? All right, then I'm going to call for a motion to approve the new job description for our special education assistant two as presented. I make a motion that we approve the new job description for special ed assistant two. I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you. All right. Um, safety coordinator, Dr. Gill. Thank you. So um, as we all know, safety is one of the most important um, aspects for all of us at all times, student safety and, and staff safety. Um, and uh, so um, to, to, with that in mind, what we, what we have been working on is to have a safety coordinator position for the district so that we have a one go-to person who um, will be responsible for uh, anything and everything that has to do with safety. Of course, other people pitch in and help, but one, one safety um, position. It's only a 10% position, and uh, um, so it's a, it's a is a management uh, part-time position. And uh, um, to ensure that we have consistent commun communication, consistent procedures, safe schools, compliance with safety regulations, um, also the, uh, uh, the, the safety plans for the school sites and, and also the ongoing professional development for staff. And then the safety coordinator position will be funded with the use of uh, safety credit funds, not uh, no impact will be on general fund for this position. Okay. So I do have one question that I'd like to have clarified. Um, now that Dr. Patton has moved out, will this be the position that will attend um, the city? That's correct. The, sa all the, the safety, safety, safety okay. district, yes, meetings, um, all the partnership things, yes. Because that's an important partnership. I want us to continue that so that we are part of the bigger safety plan. So I just wasn't sure if that's where this was going. Okay, are there any other questions for Dr. Gill? Yeah. And at 10%, this would be added to somebody's position? It wouldn't be a separate hire? Um, that's a great question. We're going to advertise the position. Mm -hmm. Let's see who applies okay. and go through a process. Okay. That's All right. Fine. So any other questions? Then I'm going to call for a motion to approve the new job description of a safety coordinator as presented, please. I make a motion that we approve the safety coordinator job description as presented. Is there a second? I'll second that. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 All the, any opposed? Hearing none, the motion, the um, job description passes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I would just like to make one more plea from everyone to please spread the news. Meeting two is coming up. Please make sure you go to your website and um, you could provide feedback there. You don't have to come to the board meeting. Encourage people to get up on the website and in fact look. Georgina, I'd also like to ask you to do a favor for us, please. We get um, meeting notices of the safe routes to school, which is with the city as well, that the meetings are happening. We, In fact, we just got the cancellation that they canceled. It was around the time of the Kincaid fires. But we have never been notified of the city meeting regarding 
traffic and bicycle and pedestrian. So can you ask someone, could you look into that for us and then we could decide how we can all divide our time and figure out who can get there. Okay, that would be great. All right, any other questions or comments? With that said, thank you everyone. Meeting is adjourned.